So your most secure LGBTQ plus parent is someone who has, um, is either the biological parent of the child or has a court order. You're listening to the Texas Family Law Insiders Podcast, your source for the latest news and trends in family law in the state of Texas. Now here's your host, Attorney Holly Draper. Today, I'm excited to welcome Christine Andreessen to the Texas Family Law Insiders podcast. Christine is the owner of Cha Law Group in Austin, Texas. Christine, who thought she would grow up to be a rock star and who was a varsity fencer in college, is now a family lawyer and a married mother of three. Her firm focuses on helping the LGBTQ plus community in various aspects of family law. She has represented LGBTQ plus clients in divorces, parents of trans kids and SAPSR modifications, trans children as an attorney ad litem, and scores of trans adults and children in changes of name and legal corrections of gender. Christine regularly speaks about LGBTQ plus issues in family law at local, state, and national conferences. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, you've got a lot of the key bits. Let's see. I have two poodles also. <laughs> you got a, you know, I'm a family lawyer. I'm a reader. Go to a lot of plays. Uh, but uh, it's Austin. I, I live in Austin, so I go to a lot of, not as much as I used to, live music. But, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm also just like a big geek. Um, I help people make babies. I do a lot of reproductive law. Adoption law is a chunk of my practice as well. But I help. LGBTQ plus families. Um, my friend Bill in New Jersey says, womb to tomb, sperm to worm. Uh, so <laughs> still his slogan. Just a variety of family law issues that people have, or I try to refer people out if they come to me with something that we just don't do, like employment law or criminal or something like that. It's a big chunk of my practice. LGBTQ. So how long have you had this focus on helping LGBTQ plus clients? I mean, I remember it was maybe late 2006, early 2007, and I was making my first website. And I was like, do I do a tab? Do I mention that on my website? Uh, And every single person in the state who specialized in LGBTQ plus family law didn't say so on the internet, which I thought was weird. And I was like, well, I'm in Austin. There's probably enough like groovy, hippie, straight people who won't care. (laughs) Like, yeah, that's cool. uh, you know, and if I don't get, you know, maybe because of my focus, you know, I don't get some rich lady in Westlake as a divorce client, but I'm, she, we probably wouldn't get along that well anyway. So it's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, just from the start, I was like, well, I'm interested in this. I go to all the CLE there is on this in the state and, you know, some nationally that started later, probably going to the national conferences, but uh, I just decided to say I did it, which turns out to be good for SEO. So it was a good business decision. It was just, it was a little bit scary at the time though. Was, yeah. For sure. I'm sure you've seen things evolve quite a bit in that now almost 20 years. Yeah. So you touched on this a little bit already, but how would you describe your current practice? Um, I would say... It's about a third reproductive law, uh, meaning surrogacy, adoptions, other kinds of interesting ways three people make babies, um, sperm donor, egg donor, embryo donation, sometimes it's four people. And then about 10% is maybe five, five to 10% uh, you know, goes up and down of helping trans folks do uh, change of name, correction of gender identity, and the rest, tiniest bit of CPS. So I said, you know, I have one, I guess if you look at my hours, it's more, I have, I've currently one CPS case, but it's a doozy. And so um, I've pretty much stopped doing that, although I have a lot of experience doing child protective services. Um, the remainder, I, I would have to you know, do some math to figure out the remaining percentage, but a, a chunk of my practice is just regular old family law, divorce and custody work. Although it tends, I, I have a tendency to uh, be representing like a trans person who's discovered they're trans later in life and they're 
spouse didn't realize they were married to a trans woman and would like a divorce. And, um, you know, somebody's gay, somebody's queer, LGBTQ plus in some way, um, in my family law, but I tell people I will help your straight friends get divorced too. I have a few clients that just, uh, a regular old opposite sex, cisgender divorce. So it's a variety. So today we're here to talk about a few different LGBTQ plus focused legal issues specifically related to family law. And the first one I wanted to just touch on because I see so many lawyers like in the Texas Family Lawyers Facebook group asking questions about this topic, and that is the gender marker change. Can you generally explain that process? Well, that is one of the few areas where I'm delving outside the family code. It's actually terms in the Texas Health and Safety Code, where there has to be some procedure to correct a birth certificate, to amend a birth certificate when there's an error on it. I had a client, cisgender, and just for anyone who's not familiar, cisgender means you are not transgender. Like the body parts you have are the body parts that's, that matches your internal conception of your own sex or gender. So you are not a trans person or non-binary person. So um, cisgender guy, male body parts, feels like a guy, male, 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 had a, I'm a boy, it's a boy uh, bracelet or something his mom had saved from his birth in a baby book, but his birth certificate said female, right? So I think everyone would agree there needs to be some way to fix it when doctors goof birth certificates. We do it in adoption a lot as well, where amending birth certificates to match adoptive parents' names. Um, that is a like fairly accepted use. So, and name change. The name change isn't always for gender reasons. Some people just never liked their middle name, ne- didn't get a middle name, and want to honor a relative, or you know. There's huge numbers of reasons. Um, Lately with the real ID requirements, people are finding that their birth certificate has some slight variation from their driver's license. People who are 50s and above, they weren't always like making sure everything matched perfectly way back when. And so some folks have to amend their birth certificate to make everything match to renew their drivers. Anyway, so there's these procedures to fix problem birth certificates. And so trans folks are using that to amend to their chosen, their correction of name and their chosen gender. So we do a name change correction of gender under the terms where we can correct birth certificates. The, the most important thing I can tell other practitioners is unless you are personal friends with the judge who you know is open to this, the easiest way to do this is to do it in Travis County. Um, Travis County judges have decided that as long as the person either lives in Texas or was born in Texas, that that's enough to hang their hat on um, jurisdictionally. If there's a Texas birth certificate or they live in Texas now, then they will do them for folks statewide. Uh, My friend Claire, who is uh, smarter than I am and published a lot of papers on this topic, calls it permissive venue. I was calling it waiver of venue for a while. I think either way works. But the Travis County Law Library has forms to do this. People can call me if they have questions along the way. Um, You know, you need your fingerprints. That's a requirement of any name change, not just for transfer is just a statutory requirement and uh, um, a doctor letter is what the judges like to see. So we do an affidavit or an unsworn deck under penalty of perjury. We do a doctor letter and they have a fairly standardized way of doing it. When you are working with a local judge who is well-meaning but hasn't done this before, you are much more likely to need to have like an in-person hearing with a client, explain the law to the judge. You should look up paper by Claire Bow, B-O-W, you can email me and I'll send it. If you want to educate a local judge, you can do it. But if you want to take a pro bono case for a friend and educate a local judge and your friend is willing to go through that process, but if they just want the fastest and easiest way, the Travis path is a well-worn path. Um, there's some issues around name changes in criminal history. Uh, if folks have a high enough criminal history, they're going to have an issue, but um, that's it just true anywhere under the law. So you mentioned that Travis County Law Library having forms. Are those available online? Because for anybody... Yeah, if you just Google Travis County Law Library forms, 
and all that okay. kind of stuff. Yeah, they have a they have a few things different than what's on Texas Law Help, and that's one of them is the the gender correction paperwork. And I would encourage attorneys who are thinking about doing this in their home jurisdiction to not <laughs> for the most part because. <laughs> I mean, I had an experience, it wasn't with a gender marker change, but it was just with a name change for a transgender teenager. And that judge, I mean, I have never been more mortified of how that judge behaved and treated that family and treated- Yeah, with, if you've got someone under 18, I would I would know the judge personally and have vetted it beforehand before you bring a client and a child to, to someone that's not going to treat them well. Yeah. I mean, you know what, though? I had lunch with a judge. A friend of mine grabbed me an advanced family and grabbed some judge from some county near, but not in San Antonio, like somewhere more. I don't, I didn't, I got the idea it was more rural than suburban. And he was lovely. He was telling me some friend of his had like submitted to Travis. He was like, why didn't you come to me? I would have done it, you know? And his friend was like real country, but was like, you know, better a happy daughter than a dead son. You know, so sometimes you would be surprised that I think some of it is age. Sometimes younger judges are better on these issues than we think. But yeah, don't bring a kid before them if you're not sure. And, and I, I, wouldn't take an adult. I probably wouldn't take an adult before them if I wasn't sure either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, I make sure your client is like, yes, let's like work on the local judge and try to change the law here. And I want to be an activist and participate in that. Or if, if you're just like, do you want to get it done with a minimum of fuss? <laughs> you know, like, so as soon as I feel like the lawyer is like, oh, I know the judge is here. It'll be great. I'm like, does your does your client want to do that, though? You know, like, and some, some clients do. Like, some clients are willing to do that. But I think that should be presented to them as an option. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, so switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk some about issues in divorce that are specific to or unique to dealing with LGBTQ plus clients uh, or opposing parties, I suppose. Uh, so first, could talk a little bit about the importance of understanding and using proper technology when or not technology terminology <laughs> when you are. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Oh, yeah, technology is not necessarily unique to this space, but <laughs> terminology is. So um, talk to us a little bit about the, the importance of that. I think the most important thing is just being polite, <laughs> like, which seems like it should come easily, but not always, um, you know. And so with that, like, especially if there's a trans person involved in the case, like my client on the other side, just checking in on pronouns. And I know that drives some people crazy. And if, if it can be really hard if you have a client talking in your ear and saying my husband and him and using a guy name, and then you have me as opposing counsel talking in your ear and saying her and she and using a female name, just, you know, just say petitioner, <laughs> just say respondent, you know, like, like the absent-minded judge who can't remember anybody's name, you can you can at least bring it to neutral, which will aggravate me and the client less. Um, I remember telling an opposing counsel who was very well-meaning, like, I don't know if you realize, but every time you say he, you're aggravating me. And if you want to, that's fine. I've dealt with plenty of opposing counsels who had every intention of aggravating me every time we talked. But I don't think you intend that. So can you just say petitioner? Like, you know, just being really careful when you realize someone is transgender, how much dysphoria and distress you can give to the opposing party by not using, at least if it's going to drive your client crazy, just use the gender neutral, just petitioner, petitioners. Their pronoun is petitioner apostrophe S. Um, So that can go a long way um, as an opposing counsel. Um, I think you need to be really aware of your judge. Uh, there are certain cases where it would be a really bad idea to go before the court and it would be a really good idea to settle. Uh, if, you, if you're representing a person who is out and proud and LGBTQ plus and you are in a ruby red rural county with a judge who is socially right wing and you know, you know, you know, 
You don't know is just because they have an R after their name. There are some libertarian judges in Texas who are, you know, they 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 say they're they run as Republicans, but they are very live and let they might get the pronouns wrong, but they are very, you know, if they wouldn't want to hear about the sex life of a straight person, they don't want to hear about the sex life of um, a gay or other LGBTQ plus person, right? Like, so there are, so you can't make assumptions. You need to ask around, but there are some judges that you would rather not put someone from that community before if you could possibly settle, even if it's not the most favorable settlement. You know, it could be better than having your client abused all day in court. So. Yeah, we've, I've seen, um, you know, I live in a pretty ruby red county myself and, have seen attorneys who have a case like that where they have to request jury trials because it can't settle and yeah, yeah, that the jury be, any better. I don't know, but they know what they're going to get. If from they them. know the judge is just going to do everything to like harm their client, a jury is at least a wild card. And the nice thing about Wadir is, so I, I'm from the north, so I say it. I say it the the Frenchy. <laughs> The French-esque <laughs> way. Uh, the nice thing about voir dire is during jury selection, you can uh, you can select out people who are the worst bigots, right? You can be like, you can get some people for cause if they feel strongly about it. And then you can use your strikes on like the, the ones who are like kind of, you know, a little too much Fox News, but they say they can be fair. So so that's, a, you, you end up with your jury as a more neutral at least like the middle of that county, not the furthest right of that county that you're in. I mean, it ain't free. So exactly, you've either, yeah. you've either gotta like give your client some low bono or have someone with serious money who understands how bad the judges and the dollars they're fighting over are worth it. Or you're like, eh, jury trials are fun. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the day of jury selection for free and charge you what I charge you for. I mean, you know, there's financial considerations when you're solo small firm even even if you're for one of the big firms which you know for family ones like 10 people um <laughs> you know you you've got to think about the money too you can't always do it and sometimes it's just better to settle a bad settlement i agree okay so are there anything any specific extra intake questions or issues that should come up in an intake if an attorney is meeting with an LGBTQ plus potential new client? I think, uh, so there are two major issues which come up and one which are come up sometimes in opposite sex relationships, but more are more frequently bigger issues in same sex divorce, which would be parentage issues and then informal marriage issues. Um, and I'll talk about informal marriage first because it's a little bit sim. I mean, it's we could do a whole hour just on that, but I tend to ramble on about the parentage stuff longer. So for informal marriage, one thing you want to ask is, so you ask their date of marriage, but then you also want to make sure to ask, I, I would advise this for opposite sex couples too, but how long were you together? And how long were you together in Texas? Because what you could have is a situation where one of them, usually the poorer person, claims the date they moved in together in Texas as the marriage date uh, versus the, the date of formal marriage. And that can get at a larger share of community property in some cases. Which is generally why the person would bother to have their lawyer do that. Um, and then because... There were some people who got married, you know, who are in Texas now who got married pre Obergefell. Like you could do it in Massachusetts for about 10 years earlier. You could go to other country, you know, people got married in Canada. Um, so California, you know, there are people who either were got married somewhere else and then moved here or lived here, went somewhere else to get married, came back here. So there are people with earlier marriages, but it's just more common because of this Obergefell bright line 2015 for people to have like say a 20 year together living together in Texas period and a shorter marriage period a for, formal marriage period at the end so there's room for an informal marriage claim depending on the facts and the Texas Supreme Court hasn't yet ruled in but the trend seems to be in appellate courts to saying 
uh, informal marriages can go retroactive pre Obergefell. There's a federal court case applying Texas law, Rannells, which was came out pretty shortly after Obergefell. I think it's two N's and two L's, but I would have to look up that in my own paper <laughs> to remember the spelling. <laughs> Um, and then there are starting to be some cases applying that, but just be aware it's not totally established. There's going to be some persuasive precedent, but you're not going to, in every jurisdiction in Texas, find something definitively binding on the court that they have to go retroactive pre Obergefell. So there's some like room for settlement there. I think that's a really interesting, unique issue to same-sex divorce cases, because if we're dealing with a heterosexual couple who lived together for many years and then they had a formal marriage, we definitely do not consider that pre-formal marriage as an informal marriage. You can. There's some case law. The case law is actually opposite sex couples. It's called tacking. So it can be done. It's not it's not, for for head, for same sex couples. It's usually like maybe you have like a one year period tacked on to like a twenty year marriage. Like they don't often live together for twenty years and then be formally married for five. It, it it tends to be where the dollars aren't worth fighting about it in court and then appealing. But there have been some. There there are a couple appeals saying that it can be done in opposite sex or same. I don't know if there are any. If there is any same-sex case law on tacking yet, but there's clear case law on it for opposite sex couples. So it's it's not, it's just not as common of a fact set and it's not as common that the time period was that long. Um, so it's not when I've seen as much for opposite sex couples. But the other thing to ask people is just check out if they, some people like collected, like they got a domestic partnership here and then a marriage in Canada and like, if people collected, you know, you could, you could theoretically have gotten like civil union in Vermont and then a domestic partnership in Pacific Northwest and then come and gotten married. So ideally it was all to the same person. You might need to call a specialist like me in the state if they have an old Vermont civil union that they never undid or dissolved. But if it was all to the same person, I have not had issues if we throw in, like, and by the way, the California domestic partnership is dissolved. And I've successfully thrown that into a divorce and also to a SAPSER where they were agreed they were unmarried, but they had a kid together. So um, Texas courts have jurisdiction to do that if everyone is in Texas because nothing in the family code says they can't. Um, I think it's it's more complicated if they're not from Texas. But I've never had a situation where they were breaking up and doing either a divorce or a SAPSER and someone was like, oh, and by the way, let's undo that prior relationship from the prior state. And the other person said, no, I want to be divorced, but still have our civil union or domestic partnership. So I've always, I've always had those be by agreement. Um, at least if nothing else, they can agree to be un- partnered or union. Um, it's something else to keep an eye out. It can have, I, one of the Pacific Northwest states had something for domestic partners where if they didn't say they didn't want this, they automatically converted those all to marriage, which would be a really good thing to know if your client was accidentally a bigamist yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to like try and help them unwind that. Um, so it doesn't come up for everyone, but it comes up some just because not everywhere did gay marriage instantly. Some people went and, and created this middle status in, in certain states. And, and they're still around in certain states, although I think they're, they're going away. But extra question, extra intake. <laughs> this episode of the Texas Family Law Insiders podcast is sponsored by the Draper Law Firm providing family law litigation in Collin, Denton, and Dallas counties and appeals across Texas. For more information, visit draperfirm.com or call 469-715-6801. So what about a divorce that involves a transgender party? What types of things should attorneys be considering that are unique to that? Type? So 
Um, it depends. <laughs> so, um, it, so I think one of the things to be most Holly, and we should go back and talk about parentage some more. Oh, I got that down further. Oh, you can, 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 we'll get there. Okay. For transfers, I think it depends. So if you've got, uh, sometimes the thing you need to be most aware of is the emotional dynamic. So if you've got a marriage of a long period of time and a trans person in their 50s, 60s, who's just realized that they are trans and their spouse had no idea, then a lot of time that spouse feels dumped. Even if they're the petitioner, even if the transgender person's like, we could stay married if you want to. Sometimes the spouse is like, I did not sign up for that. I like men. And you're telling me, you know, even in the most progressive circles, you're allowed to be attracted to who you're attracted to. So, you know, so I like men and you are saying you are a woman and doing things to make yourself look and act more like a woman and I am not attracted to women, <laughs> you know? Um, so even in your most progressive circles, you're going to have issues there. And I mean, some people say, I, I think those spouses are the most amazing spouses of all, but they're like, I just love you no matter what, but that's not in the cards for everyone. So is, if there's more right-wing feelings or disapproval of gender, that it, I mean, the, what the spouse is going through can be like, devastating to that person which as family lawyers we we deal with in a lot of contexts but it's just important to be sensitive to that now you're tr the trans person can also be going through an emotional journey but often by the time they've decided to come out to their spouse and they're talking to a divorce attorney they've often gone through a lot of it so they're often like they've gone through their stages of grief by the time they're talking to you not always but it's just, it's good to know the dynamics. I, I had a, a divorce where my client, I think she called herself queer, or possibly a lesbian. And she had kind of known that her partner was thinking about transitioning when they started dating. And so then when he transitioned, she gave it a shot for a while. And then finally was like, yeah, I, I like women. You're a guy now. <laughs> So the dynamics there, she had always kind of known she'd been willing to give it a shot going into the relationship. It was just so much more amicable than someone who'd been in a relationship for decades and felt very taken by surprise. Like, did you ever love me? Was I, was I always just a beard? So, you know, when everybody's queer, it can be a little emotionally easier for clients. So uh, it's the issues are not so much legal issues, but the kinds of things that come up with opposite sex couples as well. Like if someone's going to start to date and the partner's like, oh, I am nowhere near cool with that. You can get into adultery allegations that affect community property, but it's more just, oh gosh, don't start dating yet. You're going to cost yourself 10 grand more, 50 grand more in hurt feelings fees, you know? So it's more like family dynamics and understanding the situation and understanding advice, like please don't start dating yet to give clients that sometimes they listen to. And the legal issues, I guess you sometimes see, you could see a waste claim around gender treatment, medical treatment. So that would be the sort of thing that would get you very far in front of like a judge in Austin. Probably, you know, if, if you have gender dysphoria and you have a counselor recommending certain medical treatments, um, if you have a medical doctor recommending medical treatments based on a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, that's going to be seen as a medical treatment in some counties. But, you know, a judge who would treat a cisgender females like a uh, boob job <laughs> as waste might not feel so differently about a trans woman's uh, plastic surgery. So, which, you know, the waste claim is in the eye of the holder. So, and so that's something that can come up um, depending on the, time, the relationship dynamics. So you can see some waste claims, you can see maybe an adultery claim, but these are, these are issues that people experience in opposite sex divorce should be vaguely familiar with, but um, if they get complicated, like 
give, you can give me a call. <laughs> like I'll talk it through. With you. Like <laughs> sometimes it, it, it goes haywire in a way that if you haven't encountered these kinds of cases before, can take you by surprise. And it could be with the judge. And that's a little scary. Again, hence my urging to settle with a trans friendly mediator. If you've got one of these kinds of divorces or sapsers and a, and a judge who doesn't know anyone transgender. So what about including a name change for the transgender person as part of a divorce decree? If you are not looking at just, you know, our typical reverting to your maiden name. I think in many situations, the negotiating of that, of like, even, even if the opposite sex, even, even if, excuse me, the cisgender spouse of the trans person is super cool with it, just the back and forth between lawyers alone could be more than the fees you would charge someone to do an uncontested name change the day after the divorce. I mean, I, I'll do that flat rate, you know, for not very much dollars. And if there are feelings about the gender transition, I, it's just not a good time. So it has to be a name you've used before. Legally, it's a name you've uh, it's a name you've used before, or something. I'm getting the I might be getting the phrasing wrong from uh, Chapter 45 of the Family Code, which is name changes. But if you can show that, like, say someone changed their email and like socially with friends they had used that name before, I mean, you can have a pretty good argument for that depending on the facts. But it's just. Why would you do that in a contested case if you could do it after? It is a possible thing to do, but back and forth between lawyers and getting terms in there is not a free process. And so you may want to wait. But if your client can't wait and the spouse is friendly, it can it can legally be done. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and get to parentage. Yeah. I think this is one of the most complicated areas when you are dealing with an LGBTQ issue because we often have non-biological parents right. in in these cases. Right. So we're likely to have some outside right. or person or something happening to have made that baby. Yeah. Right. So from my perspective, there's really two categories of people when we're talking about parentage in a same sex case. There are those that were married, and in that situation, it is a much easier journey to have parentage. And then there are those who were never married and never had an adoption or anything like that, and they have a more difficult path. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah. I mean, if people want to fight, they can usually find something to fight about, however secure it was, supposedly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so your most secure... LGBTQ plus parent is someone who has, um, is either the biological parent of the child or has a court order. So it's someone who has done an adoption or some attorneys, certain situations you'll get, have an adjudication of parentage just based on the marriage, but an adoption is probably the safest because everybody's heard of it. And then we have a no attacks on adoption after six months statute. So adoption, platinum, parentage order, probably gold. But if there is a court order from a court in Texas saying both of these people are parents, then they are pretty darn safe from attack. You know, there's, I've heard arguments made, but they don't, usually don't get very far. It is the rare exception where an argument to an adoption order or a parent to Jordan would get very far. So that's the most secure category. Uh, but biological parents have it pretty good as well. So the non-biological parent who is married to the biological parent, and they were married when the child was, when that baby was made, has a pretty solid case under presumption of parentage statutes. So um, there's a statute that I like to call the Gander Rule, which is um, it's 160.106. It says that the terms, the provisions of this chapter relating to the determination of paternity apply to the determination of maternity. So what's good for the Gander is good for the goose. So you can use the presumption of parentage statute along with that 
and, and say, okay, this person is a parent. And there is actually a court case called Trato, which lays out all those arguments that myself and some other practitioners who do a lot of this have been making at Trato beautifully like summarizes that argument. I believe they were married in Trato. There is in the presumption, if, if people haven't looked at that lately in the presumption statute, there is a category for unmarried people. Oh gosh, from memory, I think they have to be married two years. To, or they have to be together and living with a child and holding out the child as theirs for two years. Does that sound right to you, Holly? It's yeah, I think after the child, like the first two years of the child's life. I don't think it has to be the first two. Uh, well, anyway, read read that statute. If you have an unmarried person trying to claim parentage, read that presumption statute carefully. The other case to be aware of is, um, I really want to dab right now, but I'm not going to. But in, the, in the interest of DAAB. And in that one, there is a statute over in the making babies through technology section of uh, chapter 160 that says, if you are married and you're making a baby through ART, then you are a parent if, if, of that child. If, if the doctor paperwork, I don't know. It, it, it would be helpful if you're listed in the doctor paperwork probably. So, and that's not even a presumption that could theoretically be rebutted that is just, you are a parent. And that one also, there was a known donor who in that particular case signed a please leave me out of this document of some sort. I forget if it was a waiver of interest or what they had in sign. But um, so the sperm donor was like, please, please leave me alone. And they both, well, one, at least one of them wanted them both to have the kid and nobody wanted him to be a parent. So the appellate court left room for even if there is not like an anonymous donor sperm sperm bank situation for the provider of sperm to be in that donor class as opposed to that parent class. I think it can come out differently when you have someone who's like, no, wait, I want to be a parent. That was always the agreement, which um, there's a, I think it's PS out of Fort Worth. Um, which just don't tell the guy he's going to be a dad, but write it down. <laughs> if you're using a known sperm donor, write it down, preferably um, go through a doctor, get an order after. It's a warning for warning case for folks who don't hire lawyers early to figure this stuff out. But yeah, so you can have different situations depending, did the donor want to be a parent and what was the agreement? which you see in DAAB, NPS, and some of the other, there's some other fights where it came out different on standing, but a lot of it was based on like, what was the agreement donated? So you've got this other person. The simplest, if you have friends, if you have friends who are doing this, don't, sperm banks from everybody wants that to be donors. So nobody ever says the sperm bank donor is anything other than a donor. So uh, if you know a volatile couple thinking of making babies <laughs> through through uh, sperm, encourage them away from a known donor. I think if you have a known donor and there is a pre-birth uh, known sperm donor agreement, and then they go through a doctor, and then after the birth, they do a second parent adoption and he's found to be a donor and his rights, if any, are terminated, they're, you know, They've got a court, once they got a court order, it's fine. And as long as they don't fight inside, you know, the first year of the child's life where they're working on getting their legal documents, it should all come out the right way. But uh, we'll, we'll see if people, if people fight and appeal with like different facts, we come out with different nuances of these situations. But yeah, if you've got a same sex couple and they've got kids, ask how did they make the kids? When did they make the kids? Is anyone arguing? that these are not children of the marriage. And I would throw a line in there, just like, I think the normal divorce language is something like, these are the children of the marriage. And I would throw in, and and both Jane and Joan are adjudicated to be their parents, like a half sentence adjudication, uh, which could help if weird things happen in the future. So, Kind of along those lines, you know, under the DAAB case, mm -hmm. which is dealing with assisted reproductive technology, 
and a married same-sex couple, do you, does the non-biological parent need to have an adjudication of parentage or are they just a parent just like anybody else who has a child and goes on down the road? What I tell people in same-sex couples is to do the adoption because if there is any sort of problem or dispute, I had a case where CPS got involved and they were not even giving one of the moms visits or services or a path forward. So my victory in that case was to get her treated just as bad as any dad. (laughs) (laughs) cases. But I got her adjudicated as a parent and she got her once a week visits. She got a service plan. Um, So it's, it's, so it's not even just what if you die, what if you divorce? It's also what if your kid has a weird bruise and the teacher calls CPS, you know? So people are generally much more willing to contemplate their own death than their own divorce in my experience. So if you say you could get hit by a bus, wouldn't you want Joan to automatically be a parent and not have to come see someone like me when she's grieving? You know, so in the event of nasty divorce, death with the mean relatives trying to take the kid um, or CPS or other kind of state involvement and same sex couples in Texas are willing to contemplate the state not being friendly to them and doing what they want. It's safer to have this than not and not have to think about this when you're dealing with this other situation. It's family insurance. It's a tax on same-sex couples in Texas that your opposite-sex friends may not have to do. And I tell people, I hope in 18, 19 years, you look at each other and say, I think Christine upsold us and we didn't need that. Because (laughs) that means you didn't have any disasters. You know, you may have friends who never do this and don't have any disasters. And they say, ha, 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 we saved on those attorney's fees. But I have occasional clients who are like, oh my gosh, thank God I got this. And it's because something bad is happening. Um, So even though the trend in the case law is to treating both sides of the same sex couple as a legal parent using... Uh, you know, other kinds of adjudication. There are people on the other side of those briefs writing, you know, writing appellate briefs to the court, arguing the point. And we don't have, you know, decades of secure statute and Supreme Court case law saying it's all fine. So, yeah. So how would you advise a same-sex couple that is married and they have a child that they've had together for a very long time, not an adult yet, but um, they never had a second parent adoption, but they were married when they got, had this child. They've been married the whole time, no trouble in paradise for them. Would you advise them to still go ahead and do a second parent adoption? And is that because of concerns about the political climate? I think the political climate makes people who consult with you more likely to actually send the money to hire you, you know, and maybe it gets, yeah, when Trump was first elected, we got a lot of phone calls for adoption. What will I do? Oh, I forgot to say when I said my practice, I do simple wills, not nothing complicated with fancy trusts, but I do simple wills. So just a lot of get your house in order, estate planning, adoption, or a lot of people who consulted with me once about adoption and then been like, eh, let's not spend the money saying like, hey, send me a contract. We're going to do that now. Uh, so I think it makes people more likely to be like, yes, get, let's get maximum family insurance, family protection. Um, Yeah, I would say even if they are a happily married couple of a while and the kids are a little older, it's, I mean, there, what it hurts is there's a fee to the lawyer to do it. And maybe the angst of having to like have to get background checks and maybe a social worker is like looking at your family, depending on it. There's a new statute that says you don't have to do a home study if the judge says your background checks are enough, then you don't have to do a home study if you're married to each other. However, some judges want a home study. Anyway, we're, it's, it's a brand new statute and we're still figuring it out, at least in the counties where I practice, how is 
what judge is going to do what, and do we have to have an extra court hearing? And, you know, so you, you might have a social worker looking at your family. So it's not just the cost to an attorney. There's also some cost in having to be scrutinized in this way that you, I think you ought not to have to, but um, I would still advise it. Even if somebody's got a 10 year old, I mean, it's, you're still a same sex couple in Texas and you know, it's not paranoid to think that people at the legislature might be after you when they're like passing repellent laws. And is some of the questions that I heard in the, uh, the, I just went and listened to oral arguments and on an abortion case. I mean, just, uh, it's not paranoid to think that like the conservative Republicans don't like LGBTQ plus people and might pass some bad laws and make some bad court rulings. It's just true. Right. And by the time they do it, it's too late. Well, not for everything, right? Like if they're, if they're busy attacking trans teenagers and bathrooms, it's not necessarily too late to do a second parent adoption. You know, I, I mean, it depends. Like it depends right, right. what the attacks are that make you concerned and what you would need to accomplish to protect your family. I mean, if you don't have kids, just get a will and estate plan just in case. I mean, that's what people did pre Obergefell and pre same sex marriage. They did documents like a power of attorney and appointment of guardian for myself. Uh, you know, there are some things you can do where you pick the person and someone can wave it around at the receptionist at the hospital. So it depends on the situation. Well, we're pretty much out of time, but one thing I like to ask everyone who comes on the podcast is if you could give one piece of advice to young family lawyers, what would it be? To young family lawyers, um, know the judge that you would be appearing before if the person sitting in your office had a fight. And if you don't, if you accepted someone from a county you don't go to a lot, Maybe, maybe not before the consultation, but certainly before you even think about doing anything in court, call someone who appears before that judge a lot. There is so much variation because of our elected judges between, you know, there is part of Austin that is in Williamson County. <laughs> you know, they're like, there's so much variation between Travis County and Williamson County, Hayes County, Bastrop, just the adjoining counties where I am. The it's like different countries with different political systems. Uh, you know, like it matters a lot. It matters a lot. And even if people, even if everything is agreed and friendly, it helps to be able to tell them, well, if you fought, here's what would happen. So in order to not find yourself in that situation, maybe you should agree to a little bit more, or maybe you can, maybe you should make a bad agreement for you, or maybe you can hold out for a little bit more in the agreement. You need to have the, the litigation background. And I think the disadvantage, the biggest disadvantage young lawyers have is they don't know the judges as well. And they don't know as many lawyers. And like, if I was going to go to Bastrop, I don't go there that much, but I know who I'd call. I, I know, I at least know who I'd call to talk to folks about those judges. So make some friends <laughs> through the bar functions who don't live down the block from you um, and go to the bar function. So you can at least meet local judges if they go to those kinds of things, bench bar, you know. So where can our listeners go if they want to learn more about you? I have a website, chalaw, C-H-A-L-A-W.com. Uh, I used to blog a lot. I don't that much anymore. There might, you might be able to dig up some interesting older blogs. Uh, I also have a, Face, I have a business Facebook page where I will occasionally post big news. Um, I've been I need to get a marketing person. I've been lackadaisical about that lately. Um, but those are probably the two best places for someone who doesn't know me and wants to poke around and see some more of my thinking um, or like follow on the the work Facebook. Um, and then I, I will always take a phone call for five minutes from a lawyer in Texas who is trying to help an LGBTQ plus person and finds himself in a jam. Uh, I just, I need to screen and make sure you're not representing the, the bad bio mom first. <laughs> I don't want to conflict myself out if someone's trying to say their spouse or partner was never a parent, lost the right to parent, that kind of thing. But, um, 
uh, other than helping someone who's trying to say their spouse or partner is not a parent, I will pretty much take anybody's call for five minutes and point you in the right direction. Or if there's somebody local who, who is knowledgeable, point you to that person and, you know, at least briefly, uh, talk out the weird situation. I'm pretty, pretty good about that. I try to be. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. For our listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, please take a second, leave us a review and subscribe so you can enjoy future episodes. The Texas Family Law Insiders Podcast is sponsored by the Draper Law Firm. We help people navigate divorce and child custody cases and handle family law appellate matters. For more information, visit our website at www.draperfirm.com.